and welcome to Metrical Speaks. Today is Wednesday, March 26th. Maybe it's the 27th. 27th. And this is episode 242. Hey, how are you? I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. I'm the hostess of this thing. Okay. Okay. Sorry if I occasionally am a little bit distracted. The dogs are just like being in a weird energy level right now. And so like I'm not sure what's happening. I've spent... I forgot like that there's this whole we just got a new dog like three weeks ago I want to say. And so he's six months old so he's not a little baby but he's still definitely got puppy energy. Like not just in his like energy levels um, which are not like unprecedented or anything but just like his he's a puppy like it is his energy <laughs> it is his hippy dippy aura energy is puppy um and so i've been doing that like googling are dogs playing or fighting a lot <laughs> how to know when dog is actually upset so there's been a lot of that like um, and by the way, I do mean Annie, not that dude, because he's fine. <laughs> she's actually like super gentle, even when you can tell, even when I feel like she's clearly ticked off at him, she's very nice. And she was like that with Olive too. So basically Annie's the best dog ever. She's laying in a sunbeam right now, looking very angelic. She's the best. Okay. Okay. So, what was I talking about? Oh, so that's why I might be a little bit distracted. Also, you'll see, I feel like these might be our summer quarters for the podcast. Um, lighting has changed in such that our sunrise sunset goes this way. And I think we've made the transition from like the, the height of the sun um, at various times of the day now is such that the sun hits the, the house that's on the other side of us and reflects through that window that I usually sit in front of or that I've been sitting in front of this winter. Um, and so it does crazy things to the camera and the camera does not know how to make it happen. Um, so we'll probably be here for the summer now. So welcome back. Seasonal things are cool. Um, what else? I think that's all. No, I lied. <laughs> There is a bonus episode that I uploaded um, actually just yesterday. So it is um, all about my after party sweater by Astro Trolland. And it talks all about like what changes I made in terms of like fit, increases, decreases, ease, positive ease, negative ease. Uh, it talks a little bit about like how I transferred it from a pullover to a cardigan, how I do buttonholes, how I do buttonhole placement. Um, short row technique, like, um, not short row techniques because that's not it at all, but how I changed the short rows from being a solid color band into being another, um, stranded color work band. Um, let's see, I think that's about all. So yeah, so if you're, definitely if you're interested in knitting that sweater or maybe even another yoke sweater, it might be a good view for you. Um, but if you are looking to, you know, at any one of those things, you might be able to speed through and find something here that's helpful for you. So that is out in the world. If you're an iTunes viewer, it's not on iTunes bonus episodes. I do stick exclusively um, to YouTube just for my own sanity. So yeah, that's there. And then later, um, probably later this week because it's almost April. I'm a little bit behind y'all. March is always really hard for me because it's like the month that I, um, dread taxes, eventually do taxes, realize they weren't that bad and that I should definitely always do them in February. Notice that every year I wait till March at least. So this year I might be actually pushing it and wait till April 1st, but. So there, there's that dread that's like constantly, and it's so dumb. I know that, I mean, I know I'm probably gonna have to pay. It's a scary thing to figure out, like to realize the actual number that you're gonna have to pay. So that's scary and I get why that's scary, but like whatever, I have to deal with it anyway, whether I know last month or this month. And in fact, it'd be better to know last month so I could prepare more, but no, I just have to like let the wolf be on the horizon constantly rather than trying to build my piggy house that he can't blow down. What's wrong with me? So anyway, 
so March is always a really hard month because there's that happening and it's like a big transition month right like there's that happening for me specifically work-wise it's a month where I'm transitioning from doing like shop updates and that kind of thing into like okay now I'm gonna get ready for Maryland sheep and wool not the actual festival but the needles up the day before so I hope you're coming so needles up is held in Columbia which is just a tiny bit south east of um, West Friendship where the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival is held. So on the Friday before Maryland Sheep and Wool, we'll do a pop-up there. And it's a really cute location. There's very yummy Thai food that is adjacent to it. Um, and there's a little grocery store if you need a little provisions for your snacky snacks. You can get that done too. Right there. Right there. I do recommend <laughs> that you have um, a GPS or use your, your fancy phone that talks to space, or you have an awesome co-pilot. Um, not because that the location specifically is hard to find, it's not, it's that Columbia, Maryland is really hard to navigate if you're not, if you don't have help. Because there's there are like very few signs everywhere, and it's beautiful. It's, I was so surprised last year about how lush and green everything looked, because I was thinking like, like regular suburban stuff where you get patches of nice but then like also patches of not nice um but the way the city has been planned and in fact the highway systems around it just gorgeous and lovely and beautiful I was so surprised uh, of course you know New York she will everybody talks about because it it's fall so everybody talks about the foliage and how lovely it is Maryland Sheep and does not get enough credit for how lovely it is as well um but anyway Oh, so I'm transitioning into that. So there's like a lot of like gear shifting and like figuring out a longer term planning is always scarier. You know, scary is maybe too big of a word. It's always uneasy. Taxes loading. Just remember there's like a paper wolf. Right. It's, it's right here. In fact, it actually might be right here because let's face it, it's almost April. <laughs> If you're not in the United States, our taxes is, are due mid-April. So, like, the wolf is coming! <laughs> but anyway... Okay, so that's that. Um, <laughs> there's, like, no good transition. <laughs> really, like, I hadn't planned on talking about that, but I did all the same. Okay, so I think in this week's episode, I'm going to talk about, like, what's in my nonfiction pile. <sighs> Speaking of <laughs> transition, so one of the things about transitioning into doing, um, like, one of the really, the things I'm so grateful for about my job is that a lot of, during most of the year, I don't have to actually house a lot of inventory. Now, I have a lot of raw materials inventory in terms of, like, fabric and zippers and shipping supplies and but I don't have to house a lot of like actual finished product uh, because usually I you know I get done I have an update and I move it out and I am eternally grateful for that not only from a financial perspective but just from like a house management perspective um, because I do not have a specific um, you know space that is uh, distinct from the rest of my home <laughs> that the shop operates out of. Um, it can get a little bit like ka 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 in here. Um, and so festivals do bring that or like, you know, doing an actual in in person event um, really does bring that like out because <laughs> you're trying to manage lots of raw material inventory that goes into production. And then you're holding on to a lot of produced items that are waiting to travel with you across the Across the lands um, to hopefully go into the hands of awesome knitters but so oh but so that was because because I think because I'm also I'm feeling that in my my works like we have a four square house where there's just four rooms on the bottom floor and so the front room um, that's adjacent to the front door like that's connected to the front door um, which I guess would be maybe like traditionally have been like a formal sitting room maybe um, anyway that is where I'm maintain the majority of my well that's where I do my business and so it's 30 by 15 I think is the dimensions maybe it's 15 by 15 because the whole house is 30 by 30 
yeah, you, can't, you could not lay five of my husband down in this room. It's 15 by 15. Um, and so while I'm super grateful that I have that space to work in, it can get a little bit like <laughs> this time of year. Um, so I think maybe because I'm feeling that tension in my workspace, I'm more, even more aware of clutter in my other spaces. And so I've been like really enjoying reading lots of different things, but then I get freaked out because uh, it all like becomes like very disorganized looking. And I wish I could commit to reading nonfiction only on a Kindle or something, but for some reason, I do really like having an actual physical book for nonfiction, especially when I'm skipping around a lot, um, which I tend to do when I'm reading nonfiction. And so I've been having a little bit of like, I need a better management system for this my stack of nonfiction books so that I've been like looking at lately so I brought them in here to tell you about them <laughs> and then hopefully when I take them back in there I'll figure something out I probably just need to make myself like a little bin or something or like a little you know like sturdier like standing open like bucket bag or something um so that I can put them in there and they, they feel a little bit more tidy because I usually just put them in a stack, but then I get a little bit like, oh. <laughs> what do you do for like your nightstand stack or your, mine is always on the kitchen tables or dining room table because that's like where the, where I do my reading and stuff. So do you have an amazing management system for your like active book readings -ness? Do you? It's awesome. Tell me about it. I want to know. So. So while we're talking about that, let's just talk about it. Okay. Okay. So, so many things, right? Okay. Let's talk about the two knitting things that are on the pile first. They're not technically on the pile because I'm actively working with them. But when I just did my, um, after party roundup, I mentioned these and in case you're not interested in watching that video, which I totally understand, I just wanted to mention them here as well, uh, because I do think they're really great resources. So if you're doing any sort of stranded color work um, where you are, you know, forging out on your own and, and doing your own pattern, or what happened with me was that um, I decided to change the spacing between motifs on the sweater that I was knitting, and I found that I needed a little bit, like I needed an extra motif to place in to get my accurate um, yoke depth. And so you know, whether it's like, oh, I want to gussy up the cuff of this mitt before I start ribbing, or oh, I'd like to add a little something on this hat, or, oh no, I have just, I'm doing these socks and now I need to add, I ran out of yarn or I'm getting really close and so I wanna do some stranded stuff to try to help stretch my, the yarn that I'm currently using. Whatever the case may be. These are two great resources. So this one is 200 Feral Motifs, um, A Knitter's Directory by Mary J. Mucklestone. And the, I like both of these books for, a very, for very similar reasons. Um, and that is because they are organized by motif size. So like by pattern repeat. So like all of the two row, excuse me, all, well, single row even. So all of your single row patterns are together and so on and so forth up to, what's the biggest pattern is given? You know, 17 rows, 19 rows. So you get they're organized in a great design, like in a way that a designer needs to access them, which I find to be amazingly helpful. Um, another thing that is awesome about this book is that you have in the very front a visual table of contents. Right, they call it a motif directory, motif selector, whatever. But it has just a clip, you know, just a sample of each motif and what, so you can very quickly visually scan through what you're looking for and again it's organized as the book is uh, by increasing row repeat size so isn't that great right and in fact in many of them especially the more complicated like the the larger motifs she offers um what the pattern would look like in different colorways, which I think is very helpful. Um, for example, in this one, she just has like a three color repeat. Um, and this one is much, oops, sorry, much greater number of <laughs> colors. So, right, such a great resource. And then similarly, the, uh, the other one is Alice Starmore's 
Book of Fair Isle Knitting, of course, by Alice Starmore. Now this one has um, more information. Like this, the, the MJ Mucklestone is just motifs. Well, I shouldn't say that because now that I've said that, I'll realize that, oh wait, there was actually a whole, yeah, there is, there are techniques in the front in terms of correcting mistakes, steaking, color harmonies, um, but that is a smaller section, so 38 pages before the motifs, um, whereas this one has much, it's a much larger book in general, but the technique section is, you know, basically half the book. So you're getting more generalized information, which to be honest with you, I tend to access the motifs one more um, just because of my personal experience level or what I'm looking for. Uh, but certainly if you're newer to stranded knitting, both of them are great resources. This one actually has, the Alice Starmore actually has patterns. Um, so her pattern section is 40 pages or so. Um, so if you are looking for actual knitting patterns from the ground up, then this is a good resource as well. There is also a section on creating your own designs. So yeah, both of these are great resources and they are both resources that I imagine that you are both in your local library. So if you wanna check them out. Um, this one, the patterns, again, organized by row, but of course you're seeing you're not getting an actual um, photograph of each finished in color. You're just getting the very basic outline. Outline's not the right word, but you know what I mean, right? Um, and again, all the way from one row up to 19 row and some all over patterns like Argyle and stuff as well. So those are both great resources. And again, I had them out because I was talking about how I utilize them for my after parties better. But Here's my actual what I'm reading this week. Okay. <laughs> so it's not many. Um, and all of these books, ex well, no, that's not true. This one is not from there. Um, but I buy most of my secondhand books because as you can see, these are older publications um, from Better World Books. They are based in Indiana and they do charitable donations with your book dollars. And they, I've always been very satisfied with them, so. So this was called The Year 1000, What Life Was Like at the Turn of the First Millennium, An Englishman's World by Robert Lacey and Danny Danziger. I really dig this one. <laughs> I think it's because it's springtime and I'm thinking more about the landscape and wanting to garden more. Um, but for some reason that always makes me, I think a connection or in a very tangible way to people throughout history um, because we've all had, well, until recently, most of us have had a pretty intimate relationship with the landscape around us. And so springtime always makes me want to reread Tolkien. I'm not this year, but for some reason that journey, right? Like it's that excitement of the coming, something about that makes me want to like connect in a different way with travel and hiking and the earth. So I'm finding this one really interesting. It's been on my wish list for a very long time and I finally broke down and bought it because I'm worth it. And so it is um, a look at what life would have likely been like in England um, around the year 1000 and, and it's based on um, an illustrated calendar and so it's broken down by month and each month references the illustration from the calendar for that month, which I thought was really cool. Super fun. And so again, I'm not like basing any sort of like, <laughs> I don't know, how, you know, anything, a lot of this is speculative, like, you know, a lot of information that we're like, is speculative. There are actual artifacts. There are some, a very few written records in the case of the Anglo-Saxon, but, um, so, you know, you kind of always want to take everything with a grain of salt, but I find it interesting all the same. So I've been really enjoying that. And then it's fun too, because it is written by month by month. I think it would be a great one if you are like a person who likes, I've always wanted to like maybe one year have a collection of books that are written like in a monthly format. 
and to like schedule myself that so I read each one. I think that'd be really fun. Don't you think it'd be cool? I would enjoy it. But anyway, this is not the year I'm doing that. <laughs> And so then the next one I'm reading or re-referencing -re is Square Foot Gardening. And you can see this, this book is a rather ancient copy. But the great thing about gardening books, I mean, sure, some things are like, you know, maybe more available than they were in 1981, three years after my birth when this book was published. But pretty much your basics are the same. Um, so this, of course, is a... Again, it's like a gardening tome, not tome, that's not the right word, but reference book du jour. And so it's all about different, and you can check it out from your local library, obviously. But I was trying to get to the part that I always reference the most, which is the, um, oh, there we go. Planting schedule for continuous harvest, all like, super cute laid out. I don't know what about this graphic is so satisfying to me. Again, I think it's because I'm a hobby gardener hobbyist, hobby farmer hobbyist. I like to just hobby about having a hobby farm. Okay. Okay. Um, but so that is on my nonfiction table. And then the last one I'll talk about, it's on my nonfiction table right now, is nature walks in Southern Indiana. How specific is that? Do you love it? This is produced by the Hoosier chapter of the Sierra Club. You know you want it, right? And it's in that, okay, so it was copyright 1991, but it's in that super awesome typeface that like actually looks like, do you know what I mean? Like it is not a font of fanciness. Like it straight up looks like it could have just been mimeographed and put in here. There's this really awesome thing where they take the state mark, the state park maps and then break them down into one page pieces that like you can somehow like in your head put together. What? But anyway, I still really love it. And even though there are amazing resources like all trails and again, you can access all of the state parks online to get their maps. Um, for some reason, like planning and thinking, it helps me to have an actual like analog thing to look at, um, to potentially write in, keep reference for future um, hikes and stuff. But of course, I always check to make sure if this information is still valid in terms of like, is this trail still available or is it now a Walmart? But anyway, is that cool? Do you have a resource like that for your state? We also have like the Geology of Indiana book, which I really dig and I do think is available for most states, like the Roadside Geology. I love this book. Those are Dover books, but I, if I was a fancy person, I would have them for all, I would have all of them. I would have select the whole set. <sighs> Dreams of fanciness. <laughs> but so this is part of my current nonfiction table of like planning and wishing and dreaming. I think that's a really good thing for this time of year. Although it can make my brain a little bit too churny, which it currently is, but whatever, it'll all be okay. I'll eventually do my taxes. Probably, yeah, I will. They'll come and get me if I don't. I will, but I might wait. <laughs> Very foolishly. Um, okay. So then the other book that I brought, but it's not actually on my table because I have read it so much. But are you enjoying Shrill on Hulu? Do you have the Hulus? Are you watching the Shrill? Let me just say, I hope you are. Mega super, especially if you're a fat lady, but you don't even have to be a fat lady. Are you watching it? Are you enjoying it so much? Are you so disappointed that there are only six episodes and maybe you didn't really make an understanding that like that was all that there was and then when you found out you were very happy that it was available to you at all but nonetheless a little sad. If you are enjoying the, the, the series on Hulu, I really super duper highly recommend 
that you check out. Now this is the actual physical copy, but what I really recommend is that you do the audiobook because she narrates it and it's amazing. And I have confirmation from other brilliant humans that they agree that the audiobook is the way to go. Now, if you don't like audiobooks, obviously don't, but if you do, um, uh, please do. And if, in fact, if you've read it in paperback or you've read it in physical form, check out your library to see if they have a copy of the audiobook that you can check out. Although probably now that the series is out, your wait time is gonna be kind of crazy. But who knows, maybe you'll have many copies, I don't know. But I really cannot tell you how much I recommend this book. Uh, much like I recommended um, White Fragility and So You Want to Talk About Race, this is another of those like my top five of the last five years books. This one, you must read it, please. No, you must, no, please, just do it. Um, but it's really awesome. And just be aware of that, um, I did read about, very briefly, about her, um, let me turn this, I'm sorry. Usually I never get any texts, but suddenly now that we're talking, bah, bah, bah. Um, what was I gonna say? So I did read a little bit about um, like the production of the show and how it varied, or how it varies from the actual book, because it's based on Trill, but it is not, I mean, for one, it's a, it's a visual medium versus the book, but it's also not a direct port. Like there was lots of input from other writers. Um, there were lots of inputs, input from A.D. Bryant, who plays the Lindsay West, the Lindy West character in the show. Um, so, for example, in the book, um, her boss is named as Dan Savage. Um, versus in the show he is specifically she said specifically that she hopes that when if Dan does watch it he does not see himself completely reflected in that character so like it's not a direct from one to the other there and they do not name him as Dan Savage in the show so anyway it's so good y'all I really hope you watch it and then I really hope you talk to all your friends about it and then you all have moments Everybody is super in love with a bathing suit scene, and these are not spoilers. Everybody's super in love with the bathing suit scene, which I do really love and is very moving. But I'll be honest with you, I'm more moved by like places where she specifically confronts her boss about things, um, and she confronts a troll. Like those to me are even more like, look at this. There is an actual fat woman portraying somebody who is angry at something who is frustrated with the system, who is not just on a journey for like, she's not flawless, like she's selfish in places and she does things that are hurtful and like she is, like it's so rare to see a three dimensional fat character. And so that was awesome. Oh, and so then when I was feeling all the feelings, I decided to just go ahead and listen to Dumplin', which is a YA book by, Murphy. Andrea Murphy, is that right? I'm making things up. Where's my notes? Um, so if you've not read Dumplin', I, I'm not usually a YA Julie Murphy. Okay, sorry for the break, but delivery person came. There was hubbub. Um, and now Gus is trying to eat my square foot gardening book because he's a dirty puppy dog. He's a I forgot that puppies are so destructive. Did you think, oh, baby puppy. He's not a baby puppy. No, he's still destructive. <laughs> it's a good thing that underbite is cute, sir. Okay. <sighs> Today he's still not a biscotti. Homemade maple pecan biscotti. Anyway. So I was talking about YA books. <laughs> And um, how I really want to, I really want to read them, listen to them, what have you. I want to consume them. Um, but that for some reason, I don't know if it's because, again, part of that genre, because it is written for a specific age group, um, is, you know, that's a time where um, feelings are so intense, right? Like they're so overwhelming. 
and it's just all amplified and really like, ugh. And so I don't know if it's just because I, I don't want to be in that space again, <laughs> or if it's because I'm old and tired. I don't know, but I really want to, I want to, cause my, my daughter's reading those kinds of books and I want to like have them to talk to her about, I want to have those discussions. And you know, sometimes I can get enough into one that like, I can be like, okay, I have a groundwork. Now can we talk about what's going on in this book? Um, but so I, but I did make it an, an attempt of serious to listen to Dumplin' and I did enjoy it quite a bit. Um, so Dumplin' is by Julie Murphy. And so I thought I had to feel all the feelings Friday where I finished Dumplin' like on Thursday and then Friday I watched the movie on Netflix and then I listened to the She's All Fat interview with the author and I just felt all the feelings. And now Friday's over. <laughs> anyway, but, but, so, you know, there's like these times when you get, it's so easy to get frustrated with the internet or the, you know, the 24 seven news cycle or the, like so many of the things that are so, that are wrong with our current time. And it's so easy to get wrapped up in that. It's so easy to feel like everybody's going to, on vacation somewhere beautiful. We're not. Not everybody is. It just sometimes looks like that from Instagram. If you're not going on a fancy vacation, I'm not going on one either. Hey, don't chew on that cord. Puppies! <sighs> he looks so cute doing it too. He's like, hmm? I don't know what to talk about. Um, so, but, but I had this like, again, in my feeling, all the feelings Friday, I had this like intense combination of, again, revisiting Shrill through the television show or through the series. And then the voice of this like teenage fat dumb. And then the, she's all fat. I listened to the first two episodes of this season. Um, Actually, I listened to the Julie Murphy interview first, and then I was like, why is this interview different? Why are they, why are both the hosts not doing the show? And so then I listened to the first episode in which um, April talks about why, wait, now I don't know their names. Whatever. One of them is not doing, is taking a break this year, this for this series for health reasons. And so she did an amazing episode, the one who is not taking the break, did an amazing episode about change and anxiety around change or her anxiety around change and it was just really I mean I I, I identified with so many of the things that she talked about um, not all of the things but so many of the things and so many of the things were that she voiced were things she's they're both younger women I think that they're both in their 20s I'm 40 um, and I just had this like really overwhelming like joy that people can be seen in a way that they've not probably felt they could be seen before. At least I do. I feel like I can be seen and understood in a way. I hear, you know, other voices that I would have not had access to um, pre-internet, pre-YouTube, pre all of the stuff that sometimes is so anxiety provoking and sometimes is so intense. But boy, some of these benefits are just so astounding. And so I just had a, like, a really intense day of just like, <sighs> but, you know, that's an amazing thing. As a 40 year old woman, like if you're a 20 year old young person and you know, that's wild to be able to hear those voices in more formative years. Like, I'm so happy that I'm hearing them now. Don't get me wrong. But I just wonder what it would have looked like if I had heard those voices when I was 10, when I was 13, when I was 15, when I was 18, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder what that would have looked like. So, anyway. So that was my Feel All the Feelings Friday. At least I was one of the Oh my goodness! So great! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! It's being in the square of gardening. I didn't talk about this. <sighs> so Joanna Spring, who is Knit Spin Farm, who does amazing yarn, yay her! Um, 
last year, I think last year was the first year that she did a full on Three Sisters Garden. So if you don't, Three Sisters Garden is a traditional um, indigenous American gardening system whereby you like create you. Indigenous folks developed this form of agriculture where um, there's mounded soil in which you plant corn. As the corn grows, there are beans around it that pull beans that like are climbing beans. So they use the corn as support to grow up that helps to pro that helps protect the corn um, during um, winds and other sort of weather events. And then there are squash planted at the base of the mound and their roots, their roots and their leaves and their foliage all provide additional shade to prevent um, of evaporation from the soil. So there's this like intense, like beautiful harmony between these three plants. And then they are such high nutrition value, like awesome plants. I mean, corn gets a bad rap nowadays because like it's basically like just oil turned into a plant. Um, but <laughs> it is an amazing plant. Um, and so, so I decided, I don't know why I like had never thought about it before, but we do like raised beds because we have a very small urban yard. Um, and I just have never understood exactly how to, um, to do any other way. So we typically use um, raised beds and like grow bags. Um, and I say that typically meaning like the two years out of the 15 years I lived here that we had a garden or maybe three, maybe four, but not all the years. But so this year we have a tree cut down in our backyard. So we have like way more sun. And I realized I could totally do a three sisters garden and I'm so jazzed about it. So if you've done a three sisters garden in raised beds or in grow bags or just in general, let's talk about it. I should totally YouTube comment that stuff up. Cause don't you think it'd be cool? I may do popcorn. I don't know. Should I have realized this before I bought my seeds for the year? Uh, probably. It's fine. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> so I do want to hear about it. What else? Oh my gosh. Did she's all fat? I did shrill. I did actively not vacationing. And by the way, that is not me being spiteful or resentful of your of your vacation. I was so jazzed to see everybody's Eden Yarn Fest photos. So jazzed. So happy that people are getting to do that. So I don't, to, by the way, did you watch Books and Cables vlog? Lots of folks that have vlogged, but hers is the one for some reason. I don't know if I just like happened to like, it just clicked in that that was the one I was gonna watch this year. And I really enjoyed it. It's still going actually. So hooray. Um, because she did, Free trip roaming about like Isle of Skye and all kinds of cool fun stuff and then she did EYF itself and then she's doing other trips after EYF in Scotland. <sighs> Eden Yarn Fest. Eden Yarn Fest. <laughs> Eden Yarn Fest. That's probably actually a thing. Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I apologize. Um, and did you wonder why it's at the corn exchange? Because like hi what is all this stuff about corn that's in the Britannias? It's because corn is the generic word for grain. But that doesn't make sense to us in the US. I was so confused for so long. I don't... <laughs> but anyway, so Books and Cables is wonderful. So I'm not in any way like that. When I say that I'm actively not vacationing, of course, there's a little bit of like, oh, I would really like to do that. But it's like, Oh, I would really like to live on a farm and have magical um, brownie helpers that helps me. Like it's in a way that like, oh, that would be amazing, but it's not in a way that I'm putting any negative energy on people who are enjoying those things. So I just want to make that clear. Anyway, back to it. I'm actively not vacationing. Um, pool scene, talked about it. Birds, we have new so now we have, we have added to our flock. Oh, we have a chickadee that I thought for sure was gonna get to ride in because the chickadee visited two or three days in a row. Then it never came back. Come on, chickadee, come back. 
But now we have like two nut hatches. We definitely have two downy woodpeckers, which is very, we have a male and a female. And I think I'm assuming the nut hatches are probably a couple as well. Um, and then what else? There's something else. Oh, we got a goldfinch. So exciting. And then a red bellied woodpecker. I don't know if you remembered. I saw one once and they, he didn't actually land on the feeder. He was like on the fence rail. And so now he's come back three or four days, but I haven't seen him again for three or four more. So what's going on, Red Billy Woodpecker? Get yourself together. Come back and eat my peanuts. We do have a suet feeder. Everybody's like, they love suet, the woodpeckers. Um, the thing is, like, I don't know if it's specifically because we're a city yard, but um, we are, we do get a lot of house sparrows. Now I have changed our feed um, to be something that's a little bit less interesting to them because there was a, well, actually at one point, like one of the theories of, of dealing with house sparrows is that you are supposed to put like a cheap feed out like on the ground somewhere for them because they prefer to feed off the ground. And so we have from the tree that we just cut down, we have a nice stump in the yard and also some other pieces of tree that are flat. There's a lot of tree in our yard, <laughs> still. Um, but anyway, so I was put cracked corn out on that because they do enjoy that kind of stuff. <laughs> in an attempt to help um, free up the seed feeder for some of like the cardinals and your like more interesting um, songbirds. I'm not against house sparrow by any stretch of the imagination. Like they're actually quite a charming little bird. Um, I am however against like 50 house sparrows and that's a lot. Of and in fact, when we were doing that thing where I was like trying to maintain, uh, like, so then it also draws starlings because starlings like a lot of the same feed that house bears like, and starlings are jerks. Like, they just are. Um, and they are very loud and not pleasant sounding in addition to being jerks. So there was one day where <laughs> I really looked in my yard and was like, this actually might be like a public nuisance. There are so many birds in my yard. <laughs> I really thought that like, yeah, somebody may be sending me a certified letter any minute now because it was like insane. So we've stopped that, that theory. That did not work for us. I'm not saying it won't work for you, but it did not work for us. It was intense. <laughs> I mean, really, I counted at one point, there were 40 house sparrows on the line, not counting the ones in the yard. It was a little crazy. <laughs> I felt like a bird hoarder or something. So anyway, there's all sorts of things you can do to try to deter house sparrows. Like they apparently are not the best flyers. So you can set up little like obstacle courses around your like high quality bird seed feeders. Um, to deter them. I have not gone there yet. That is an option. Um, but having taken that option away and going to a seed that they are a little bit less attracted to, um, they still, we still have quite a few of them, but they're not in, insane. They're not, and again, I'm not like worried about somebody talking to me from the neighborhood. <laughs> um, not that we have a neighborhood association. No. Um, but what was I talking about this for? Sue it. Um, so the, the the thing is though, we, since we moved to that like feed that they that they'll still eat, but they are not like super jazzed about. Um, they have decided that suet is a valuable alternative to their diet, and so our suet feeder gets like packed with sparrows. And so since our nut hatches and our woodpeckers seem more than happy to eat the peanuts and the sparrows still try to eat the peanuts, but they don't like they're, they probably aren't as successful. They have a really short bill and I imagine it's hard for them to, what it is is like metal net essentially like a tube that the peanuts go in. And so it's very advantageous if you have a longer beak, like an insect bird uh, versus a seed bird. It's easier to access that food. Um, so, they still are on there, but I don't think they're as successful. Um, and the woodpecker will sometimes scare them off of the peanuts. So anyway, so that's all to say that the peanuts are working for us. The suet is not working for me right now. <laughs> we might try the um, fake bu the bug block. Because we have some very forlorn looking robins who just sit on the post and look at me like, I'm like, dude, there's 
I know there's worms. I I'm sorry. There's clearly like a pill bug somewhere. Other than that, I got nothing for you. I'm sorry. So, should we talk about knitting? This is going to be one of those where I name it like how far in the knitting is because I have just talked about nonsense forever. And I would apologize, but I won't. Um, because every once in a while, you just need an episode like that. Okay? Okay. Now, by the way, I didn't tell you this, but I went to a knitting weekend between this time and the last time we talked. So anything that I talked about, I may have stolen from any one of those brilliant human beings, um, and not given them credit. And I acknowledge that, but it was lovely. Oh, if you have a chance to go hang out with knitters for a minute, that are awesome. That is important. They need to be awesome. They don't need to be awesome knitters, but they need to be knitters who are awesome. If they're also awesome knitters, well then, hey, that's exciting. But it was lovely. It was really nice. I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, just to acknowledge I may have stolen any of those things from our conversations, because we had lots of good conversations. Lots of good conversations about diet culture and family interactions and oh, just lots of good stuff. Anyway, let's talk about knitting, okay? Okay. So I have my Pebbles and Pathways sock. I don't have tons done on it, but this is a pattern by Hay Brownberry, who is Mars. What's your last name, Mars? I'll put it in the show notes. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but you can find it under Pebbles and Pathways. And I'm knitting mine with Quince and Company. Chickity. In the honey colorway. Because it's the best colorway ever. So I am knitting mine in sport. Because I have giant feet. And uh, this is a non-super wash. Non-nylon sock. So I'm just checking it out. And I thought it might be advantageous to do the sport. As a little bit thicker. To see if that would help with wear. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. Now, the pattern is written toe up with a heel. It is toe up, right? Now that I say that, I'm like, hmm, maybe I'm lying. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, toe up with the heel. But I did, I'm just going to do an afterthought heel because I was with folks uh, when I got to the heel place and I did not want to stop and try to look at a pattern. I just acknowledge that. And also, I've decided to only do the patterning on the front because I'm lazy. Uh, but I really enjoy it. It is the perfect amount of something going on. You have every other row is just a knit row. You have the garter ridges built in, which helps you to figure out where you're going to be putting the twist in your cable. So there's never like a tedious amount of counting. I know that X number of rows from this marker, I need to do a cable twist, right? Brilliant. Love it so much. So I'm a horribly slow sock knitter, but I do enjoy it when I do it. So so there's that. And then I have a little bit more done on my Emma yoke. And of course I left the pattern over there. So I will put the author of the pattern in the show notes. But this, oh my gosh, right. See, this is the back. So here I am so far, right? You can tell so much because it's all bunched up on a needle. But whatever. Whoa. There it is spread out. So this is a little bit wild for me in terms of color. It's a lot of colors, right? Um, the body of the sweater will be this darker green. This is Patagonia by Juniper Moon. And it is two-ply two merino. It says it's a DK. That's clearly a lie. I would say it's a sport to a fingering. Um, just to be clear, uh, oh, it's organic. That's right. It's an organic Reno, but I think it's a surprisingly good price point for something labeled organic and Merino at the same time. Um, it's $15 and 50 cents at the village yarn shop. Um, and I think that's comparable to other places that I looked. Um, what was I going to say? I don't think I was gonna say anything else. So the main color is this juniper. The blue is aquamarine, the yellow is mustard, and the pink is thistle. I really like the pink. 
which is weird for me, but. So anyway, so this is definitely a departure from my after party, which was two colors, low contrast, very subtle. And then this one was like an Easter egg. But you know, it's Easter egg time of year, yo. And I think with the, the again, the larger body of the sweater being the darker green, I'm okay with it being a little Easter eggy. Yeah, I'm okay with it. So I'm almost done with color work. These are like little berries almost that are hanging. So I have to finish this berry and then there's another berry that started next to it right here. So I probably only have maybe 10 more color work rows and then the, um, the slog I'm stuck at. I think this will be a short sleeve sweater. Um, I probably, because I don't have enough yarn to do a long sleeve sweater. <laughs> and also because I dig short sleeve fingering sweaters. They're fun. Okay. Okay. And then the last thing I have to show you, it's really not exciting looking, but I am so close to being done with this ribbing but still so far away. Um, last time I showed you my Stephen West Marled Mania cardigan, and it looks exactly the same, only more, which is the case with a lot of sweater knitting. But since this one is such a party, the party has not yet begun. We are in fact in the sloggiest of vlogs, right? This does not look like that much knitting, does it? There's 500, over 500 stitches on here. I felt better when I made that realization. Like when I actually, because I'm on my last, when it's my size, it goes to six by six ribbing. So it starts at two by two, and then you're increasing every X number of rows till you get to, for my size, six by six. If you're smaller, you get to stop at five by five. <laughs> so six by six. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, so I was really like, what is going on? These rows are taking a million years. And then I decided, okay, I'm almost to I have like six more rows until I get to, to take the sleeves out. So I thought, okay, this is probably the time I need to decide if I have enough stitches on here to make a sweater for myself. Um, so I decided to go ahead and do the maths for the gauge that I was actually achieving. And I didn't have to, I had to cast on like two more stitches. What I ended up doing was taking some of the stitches from the back Again, you're not supposed to split them out yet, but I just needed to do it because if I need to increase, I needed to do it, bef you know, now. Um, so when I did my math, I found out for my size, cause there's only like three sizes in the pattern, but the size that I'm doing goes up to a 56 inch bust. Now that I say that, I may be lying, but it's close if it's not. Um, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so, um, But, um, so I real, but I knew that the arm, the, the arm is supposed to be snug because it's like an anchor point for this sweater, right? Because of this like amorphous yoke thing that's happened, it's not amorphous, but because it does not have like a distinct neckline uh, to help anchor it, it's, it's ribbing that like crosses over, whatever. Um, the sleeve is supposed to help anchor the sweater. So the sleeve does need to be snug enough. It needs to be snug. Uh, and it's ribbing, so that helps. But I have proportionally, usually for my size, I need to make the sleeves bigger. So I needed a check to make sure that I was gonna be okay. And in fact, I would not have been okay. The sleeve would have been too small for me. Um, sorry. We've been talking so long that my hair is getting progressively more insane. Viva la rooster tail. Anyway. So I did the maths and realized that I did need more stitches for my sleeves than the pattern indicated. So, um, so, but then I did the maths for the back to see how wide the back would, because usually if the pattern, like for a 50, it's like an upper bust, full bust thing, right? My back does not need to, if I'm working a 56 inch pattern, I don't have 28 stitches on the front and 28 stitches on the back because my boobs are not evenly distributed on my front and my back. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I, and it comes to find out I did need fewer stitches on the back and in, on the back. And in fact, those numbers kind of worked out where I could literally just move the stitches from the back to the sleeves. And I assumed I did not want a lot of positive ease in the back because 
it's ribbing and it's not like I stretched it like this to measure my gauge. Um, so it still has give. Um, so even I figured like maybe zero to one inches of positive ease would be good. We'll see. <laughs> that would normally be fine in the sweater for me. Um, but again, this is definitely a different garment that I'm usually, that I'm used to knitting. So we'll see how it does. Uh, but I think it'll be fine. <sighs> is that all I need to say? I think so. But that's all to say that again, I was like, what the heck? So when I did all that math and realization, that's when I realized that like, oh, there's over 500 stitches on the needles. Yeah, that's probably why this is feeling like it's taking forever to do each row. Because even on, you know, a fingering weight sweater, I usually don't have that many stitches. Maybe, again, maybe right one before I take off the arms, but you know, it's six inches to the inch. That's not how many, but anyway, so many stitches. And because it's worse to weight, you think like, oh, it's gonna be snip, 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 doo. No, forever. And it doesn't even look that big. Mm. Mm. But it is. <laughs> I did make sure my gauge was okay, and it is. But so any minute now, I'm gonna have to actually put colors on it. Oh. oh. I'm just gonna go with wild abandon. I don't even think I'm gonna pretend to like do them in any sort of reasonable, planned way. <sighs> this ribbing has kind of killed my soul a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. It is really soft though. Should I tell you what I did it with? <sighs> no, I've talked about it for 25 minutes. I'm knitting mine with uh, Barrett Wool's Company's Wisconsin Woolen. Held together with some hand-spun hobbledy-hoy batlings, held together with some mohair silk insanity. I picked, I picked this one up for from the local yarn store because I ran out of the leftovers I had from my hedge witch shawl. And this is Stacy Charles Fine Yarns Luna Effects. That would've been cute to use for a hedge witch shawl. Luna FX, 70% mohair, 30% silk, 232 yards. It's very similar to the Northampton Wool Southampton. So, yeah, Valley Yarns, excuse me, Valley Yarns Southampton. I just totally just jammed this in my ear. So anyway, I'm really, oh gosh, any minute now I'm gonna be finished. I really do have like six and a half more rows. And then I can take a take the sleeves off, and then um, B switch to doing colors, which will be fun. But so I don't know how I feel about the mohair. I'm a little bit like that was a good idea when I started three balls ago. Um, I'm not sure I feel about it now, <laughs> but I really loved the look of the um, the sweaters that had a very plush looking rib. And because my hand spun is not super consistent across the board, I knew there would be places that would be skinnier. And so I thought that the mohair silk might beef it up enough that it would still be at the correct gauge, but have that very plush look to it. I did not want it to look scrawny in any way. So I am pleased with how it looks. We'll see how I feel about it. it is, I mean, and it's nice to, I don't know why I'm worried about it. Shut up. such a jerk. It's fine. Why am I concerned? It is fuzzy, but it's soft and lovely, and I'm sure it's going to be a-okay. I'm so worried. Okay. I think that's all. Next time I'm going to do prizes for Patreon, so if you are a supporter of the podcast via Patreon or PayPal, um, and you've donated it all during the first quarter, which is, of course, January, February, March, that I will um, draw for prizes next time. I don't know what your prize is yet, but I think it's going to be napkins. That's a nice prize. Sorry. I use my ironing board as, like, my table while I'm doing the podcast in here. And for some reason, it has this, like, extra little table underneath of it which just constantly gets bumped and makes a lot of noise. I don't really even know what I would, 
I don't know what I would use this table for underneath my ironing board. Maybe I could put my very crisp pressed shirts under there. <laughs> That's not what I'm using it for. Um, so yeah. So again, I do apologize that this show is a little bit more like rawr, 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 than normal. I know some of you really dig that, so I'm not apologizing to you. I'm apologizing to the other people. <laughs> um, I think that'll be all. Again, I'll have a one row buttonhole video out for you later this week, and then I'll talk to you next time. Bye.